Sure. Thanks, Ashraf. Even I have trouble saying my name sometimes. So, <laughs> um, so uh, guys, this session is going to be about um, OpenStack networking evolution with OpenContrail, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the container networking updates we have made to the product, right? And what we have contributed to OpenContrail from that perspective. Um, Sukhdev, why don't you go ahead? Okay, so uh, I'm Sukhdev Kapoor. Uh, I'm a distingu distinguished engineer at Jennifer, part of OpenContrail team. I'm one of the uh, new members uh, of the Open Control team. <clears throat> and I'm here uh, in the spirit of what Randy was talking uh, a little while ago uh, to make an announcement of a new uh, project which I have sort of kicked off uh, in the spirit of uh, this open, uh, openness of Open Control. So I'm here, I'll take a few minutes to make an uh, announcement. Then I'll step aside, we'll let him continue with the presentation, and then I'll take the questions after the presentation, if that's all right. So networking open contrail. So for those guys who are familiar with the Neutron, <clears throat> they know what it is. But for those who, who don't know what it is, <clears throat> this is a brand new project which I have kicked off, and in, in, uh, uh, it will be under Neutron to integrate open contrail with the neutron that that would be the goal will comply with open stack uh, governance become a part of the neutron stadium so this will become like any other project uh, within the neutron community this is one piece which has been missing so far that open contrail was available as a monolithic plugin only now what we're doing is we're bringing it into uh, the, the neutron stadium to level it off with everything else. So what this does is, this gives you the ability to run uh, open control in a multi-vendor uh, deployment scenarios like you will do any other uh, uh, projects, ODL or, or ONUS or, or anything else. So this will be pretty much at the same level fields for that. What will it have? Okay. So it will have a new set of uh, ML2 drivers. Uh, it will have a full suite of service plugins to uh, be fully uh, compatible with, uh, the, with the Neutron services. And it will have its own uh, third-party continuous integration system to, to make it fully uh, testable uh, and fully integrated with, uh, with Neutron. So now with this, uh, you have an ability to be able to run open contrail with, say for example, F5 load balancer or, or Palo Alto network. So you can pull the distro out of, uh, out of uh, Neutron and, and be able to test it, integrate it with, in, in a true multi-vendor environment. That's what it gives you. Uh, <clears throat> Will it change the existing monolithic plugin? Okay, that would be an obvious question probably in your mind. Okay. The answer is absolutely not. So that initiative, this has nothing to do. This is a brand new initiative as, as a community initiative I have taken upon to run the charter and, and go, go with it. So essentially what it does is it gives a new front end to the same functionality. What you, what you have, but you can come in now through Neutron in a true multi-vendor uh, deployment scenario. So going forward, there will be two options available, okay? uh, either or, you know, but not together. So there will be a configuration knob which will allow you to deploy open contrail in a Neutron mode or you can continue to use it as a monolithic plugin as it is uh, today. Why should I be excited about this? You, know, you can deploy now open contrail from Neutron along with uh, any other driver service plugin. This is what I mentioned. Okay. Or you can uh, continue to deploy as you do it today. Okay. So there will be dual, uh, a dual mode option available. So as you know, uh, open contrail offers a whole lot more uh, in terms of functionality than what is available in the Neutron APIs, right? So that potentially could be a slight downside, 
by using, but it does give you the ability to now mix and match uh, different vendor drivers and run it as an open contrail, right? So the choice is yours. Uh, but you, know, you can test it, you know, uh, or you can deploy it or whatever. But the goal is going to be we're going to try to bring it at par as possible, uh, the both distros, right? Uh, <clears throat> so now, uh, a call for action, right? Uh, this is a community program, right? So I am the one who's like essentially trying to kick it off, get it going. So we need contributors. This is a huge effort. So we need to write ML2 drivers. We need to write uh, router service plugin. We need to write load balancer service plugin. We need to write VPN service plugin, firewall as service service plugin, everything, you know, uh, along with BGP VPN service plugin. So there's a lot of development effort. So this is not something uh, which is ready to go, or, or you can pull it off next week and start using it. This is a kickoff. So to come help us out, you know, participate and, and, and work with us and become a core developer and, and, and influence the future. You know. So now you get to, uh, uh, you get to make uh, your own changes. You, know, you, you get to test in a different environment and you can push the changes, you can influence the future, you know. And how can I contribute? I've already kicked off the project, it was approved, it, the repo is already uh, available, it's empty. So if you went in there and <laughs> tried to look for it, there is nothing in there yet, because I just got it, uh, got it off the ground last week, I believe, or a week before, you know, before coming in here, right? So. So we're gonna start dropping code in there, you know. And as we start dropping things, you now we'll be announcing it. They will, they, it'll, it'll be visible, you know. In the meantime, if you, if you have questions, you want to reach out, you know. Hey, where do I start? What do I? Uh, uh, where things are? I'm always on, on IRC. At, uh, my uh, IRC handle is Sukdev. Uh, you can uh, you can ping me on Neutron channel. Uh, I'm on pretty active in the IRC, uh, in the OpenStack channels. So you can find me there, or you can drop me an email. Uh, my, that Gmail is my email. So that was my quick uh, announcement. I'm gonna step aside, let DP continue with the presentation, and I'll take questions uh, at the end. Thanks, Agde. Um, let me just plug in this uh, slide navigator. Yeah. Just give me one second, sorry about that. Okay, it works. So, um, Thanks, Sukhdev. I think just to reiterate, uh, we always had um, uh, an integration with OpenStack, right? Right from the beginning, we used to have a core plugin. We still have that. What we are doing is providing more flexibility and more choices to our customers by starting this networking open control project and um, you know getting into the ML2 plugin way of doing things. What I'm going to focus on now, um, we have about 30 minutes. So what I'll do is for the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about um, the latest developments in uh, Open Contrail. What are we? We are going to have a release in a couple of weeks, 4.0 that uh, Randy alluded to as well. Uh, we'll talk about uh, um, containerization, both uh, at the manageability plane as well as at the you know supporting container work, containerized workloads. What our philosophy is behind that, uh, because there are a lot of container networking uh, solutions that are coming up these days, right? So um, um, I'll try to uh, uh, explain to you the value we bring uh, into this environment, and feel free to ask questions at any time. Okay. All right. So. Um, Randy mentioned, the, uh, talked about global ubiquitous networks and how we want to add more value on top of that. Um, when you look at uh, Open Contrail, what is the vision, right? What do we want to do, right? The idea is to help connect uh, people to the applications, connect applications to applications, get the right people to talk to the right applications, right? And be able to have visibility and all that into that. So at the end of the day, it's all about basically um, having people on one side, their apps on the other side, provide connectivity, security, and manageability. Yeah? Now, when I talk about this, there's no mention of infrastructure, right? That's because 
whether you have a multi, um, what do you call, whether you have a multi-site data center, whether you have, um, in terms of uh, virtualization environments, you have VMs or containers, or you have bare metal appliances, or you're a solution running in a telco pub, or you have a uh, public cloud environment. Some of our customers are already doing that, and I see some of them in the audience as well. Or the, uh, I think if you listen to the OpenStack keynotes, uh, there, were, there was quite a bit of talk about edge computing and internal, Internet of Things, et cetera. From our perspective, the idea is keep the infrastructure agnostic, keep the endpoints where they are, all that information kind of agnostic from the end user. Right, provide connectivity. At the same time, give enough tools so that as an administrator, as a network administrator or a security administrator, you're still able to enforce policies, make sure your deployments are compliant to certain requirements that you have and regulations you have. At the same time, provide manageability, right? I mean, and give you very good visibility into how you're operating. Um, um, are there any hot zones? How are things? Um, and be able to proact pretty, uh, proactively uh, alert you to any kind of issues, right? So this is like, um, we talk about vision, but actually we have uh, completed quite a bit of stuff towards this goal, right? Uh, and um, you know, very soon you'll see some, I'm sorry, uh, some announcements around, you know, what are we doing about security and so on, or how we are enhancing our existing network policy framework uh, to be able to uh, extend it to security policies and be more infrastructure agnostic, yep. Um, so this is the basic uh, kind of high-level overview of how Contrail applies in your environment. Does, uh, any questions or comments? You good? All right. So um, how many of you are familiar with open, or let me ask this, how many of you are not familiar with open Contrail architecture? Okay, there are a couple of hands, so let me just go over this briefly, right? So uh, what's open Contrail? Open Contrail is an open source um, um, uh, SDN solution to deliver on secure multi-tenancy. And how do we do that? We use overlays-based um, network segmentation, yeah? And uh, like any typical um, software-defined networking solution, we have a control plane and we have a data plane, right? So we have a controller, as uh, I show here, open control controller. And we have a forwarding element called vRouter, which runs on the compute, and on the compute so the endpoints. Now the controller runs in a high availability cluster. There are three instances and it can run in an HA cluster and it plays multiple roles. That of config, control, which is basically BGP uh, uh, control plane, and analytics. I think Randy mentioned, you know, his, when he used to think of overlays back in the past, um, his main concern was, okay, I'm going to lose visibility into, uh, you know, my underlay and how if something goes wrong, what kind of correlation information will I get? So we, understand that right we understood that right from inception so we packaged analytics module into our solution right so what we give you with this analytics module is basically um, an underlay overlay correlation along with a lot of rich set of tools that you can use to really analyze your flows be able to get a lot of information out of it <clears throat> So um, that's analytics. So the controller has three main roles, and we'll talk about uh, these three roles in the context of containerization, how things have evolved, and if it impacts any functionality in a little bit. <clears throat> BGP is the control plane signaling. So basically, when a VM comes up, we have to announce reachability to that endpoint, right? So we, typically, we use BGP control plane, highly scalable. Internet runs on it, yeah? So we can support massive scale data centers are you know, very easily extensible. You have multi-regions, you can use BGP federation to federate across regions and so on. We use XMPP to talk to, uh, to, talk to a vRouter agent which runs on the compute and which programs the forwarding tables in vRouter. Right, so a lot of our uh, value add comes from what we have done with vRouter on the compute. Um, it's a very rich functional uh, forwarding plane. And the same vRouter can actually support be it a container or a VM or any kind of uh, virtual network function. We also have uh, bare metal support today. Um, if you have bare metal appliances uh, and you want to terminate your overlays on the top of the rack switch, we can do that with Juniper switches today with OVSDB. But we are also extending it to do it using NetConf and um, uh, Net NetConf based and uh, basically having an eVPN VXLAN based fabric. Um, a key element of this um, SDN solution is the gateway, right? 
So having a gateway to basically uh, interface with the internet and be able to talk externally uh, going, for traffic going outside your, uh, your data center. So we have a, so programming the gateway for overlays, et cetera, is built into the workflow. So it's, there's nothing, no manual steps needed or no additional scripting, but basically when you create a virtual network, we automatically go to whatever is needed on the gateway um, through the workflow. So we do that based on using netconf again to provision uh, these gateways. And the core of Open Contrail is basically to be it control plane, whatever feature set it be, we implement using standardized um, protocols so that at the end of the day, you can run multi-vendor environments if that's the choice you want to have, right? So, that, so everything here is standards-based, as you can see. That's a high-level overview of the Contrail architecture. So the goal is have this architecture deliver the logical uh, segmentation and representation you're seeing here, yeah? Okay, so we, um, on, uh, at the, when OpenStack Summit started, we actually launched a blog as well about a 4 auto release where we talk about um, the upcoming um, evolution of the product, right? So um, there are two key themes to that. One, um, it's about uh, containerization of our own control plane. I mean, control is so open controller software, right? There's the controller software, there's the forwarding element. So um, just like any application software is moving towards containerization, we are doing the same. We are doing, we're taking our control plane, we are containerizing it. Why are we doing that? It's easy to use, easy to deploy, easy for lifecycle management, easily upgradable, right? The packaging dependencies are gone, now it's all well contained and more manageable. So, um, like I said, we are containerizing control, control plane for easier manageability. What does that mean, right? Um, like I said earlier, the controller plays multiple roles, config, analytics, control, right? So we're going to have three primary, um, so there's going to be a controller container which plays three primary roles, that of um, um, uh, config, I mean, let me point to the right one, config and control. We'll have a container for analytics and one for analytics DB, right? So this, these are the three main, um, containers that are going to perform the controller function. Optionally, we'll be packaging, um, you know, we always package a load balancer, HA proxy with us, but at the same time, we provide, uh, you know, we work with a lot of different partners like F5, AVI solutions, AVI uh, networks, et cetera, for load balancing functionality. But we also have an optional um, HA proxy if you would want to um, use it. We have VRouter agent, which runs on the compute. Okay, so that's the weed router agent. The functionality is talk to the controller and program the forwarding plane, right? So that's going to be containerized as well. So some of the key, um, and these can be deployed on be it bare metal or VMs. So you have OpenStack clusters with VMs. You can actually deploy the controller or containers inside the VMs, yeah? We'll talk about that as well in a minute. Uh, there's no change in the functionality, no change in... Um, APIs or anything like that. The only thing that has changed is um, uh, the form factor or the packaging of how the controller is being delivered here. Oops. What are the benefits, right? Primarily, it's about life cycle management. Um, all dependencies are now contained. Typical advantages of why people are looking at containers, right? And in, as we, our control plane evolves, we'll actually be evolving our container, like having a single container for control function, later split into microservices-based uh, architecture so that you can have different elements be upgradable easily, right? So the first step we have taken is in um, basically containerizing the function we have, but still have a good one single container. Uh, Randy uh, briefly mentioned about uh, a little bit of complexity in deploying and using Contrail, right? With containerized uh, approach, it becomes very easy to provision Contrail, and we are going to package, uh, we are going to provide Ansible-based uh, deployment scripts, etc., playbooks. So it's um, pretty simple to deploy Contrail. It's a, you can, um, um, uh, there's no complexity involved there. Integration with third-party provisioning tools simplified as well. Some of our customers use Chef, some use um, Helm, and so on, and it's easily integratable. Yeah. So these are the benefits of. Um, containerizing our control plane primarily. The other thing we are doing when it comes to um, container networking and how do we want to support containerized workloads, right? Now we are not talking about control plane, but we are talking about the workloads. So if you take this example, right? So let's assume um, this is a use case where someone is coming up with a Kubernetes cluster with leveraging our con um, 
open contrail integration for Kubernetes that's releasing in a couple of weeks. And they wanted an open stack on top of it. I mean, this is a model which some of, I think, um, uh, I think Mirantis is also doing with MCP, where they run open stack uh, control plane as containerized, um, in containerized uh, form factor on top of Kubernetes, right? And let's say they want to run multiple clusters or multiple tenants on top of it. I mean, there are too many layers here, but let's, I mean, these are real use cases for whatever reason, right? So now the object, see that most of the solutions that are there in the market would require you to have a separate networking um, control plane for each of these layers. What we are trying to do is whatever be your reasoning or why, whatever be um, your motivation to have an architecture of layering, we want to be able to deliver networking using a single control plane solution, single SDN solution, do how many ever layers you want, right? What does that mean? You have flexibility, see, um, especially when you look at telco world or some, a lot of these applications, not everybody has containerized their uh, software, right? So you're always going to have interactivity between bare metals and heck, we even see mainframes in a lot of our, uh, uh, env uh, you know, some of the environments we go into when we talk to customers. So they're going to be bare metal, they're going to be VMs, they're going to be containers, and they all need to be on the same uh, network and have access to one another for whatever reason, right? So the key objective is to be able to give that flexibility without having to add overly, over, overly, over, overly, right? So this, with a single control plane solution, what we are trying to address here is a nested environment to whatever degree of nesting you may do. Okay, and that's a very big value we provide and that's what is resonating well with our customers. And I can confidently say this is not something that anybody else can deliver to. And now we'll, in a couple of minutes, we'll see how uh, exactly we are delivering to that. So what are the key, so when we started looking at, okay, we want to onboard uh, supporting containerized workloads and, uh, you know, um, um, and be able to provide connectivity and security and all that stuff across the board, what are the key drivers, right? I mean, we have been luckily successful in OpenStack uh, deployments for the last four years. Even if you look at um, the latest OpenStack user survey, um, Contrail is, Open Contrail is uh, the number one commercial SDN. Um, so um, we are really glad about that. And what that means is we are so broadly deployed that we have um, learned a lot from our customer deployments. And so we have added enough, uh, quite a few features into our product. What we want to do is bring that, um, um, bring that into uh, containerized environments, which is still not mature in that terms, right? Like Kubernetes is still maturing. There are a lot of features that are not available. Uh, we'll talk about those features soon. Um, but um, uh, as it's maturing, there are gaps in, uh, let's say, these orchestration systems. And what we want to do is bring in our feature set so that we can help you um, transition today or help you have coexistence of different environments, uh, but still be able to do multi-tenancy, different levels of isolation and all that, right? So those are the features we are going to bring in. We also want to, uh, from an enterprise perspective, we also want to be completely um, uh, seamless, okay? Seamless both in terms of if you're migrating uh, from uh, other virtualized environments to containers or seamless in the sense um, you have a developer workflow and then you have your administrator workflow, right? So we want to keep this completely independent and transparent so that if developers want to do something, they can go ahead and do it uh, without having um, uh, to be infrastructure, uh, you know, ever, right? And at the same time, like I said, we want to keep the admin workflow going uh, independent of the developer workflow so that you don't have to tell the developer, hey, change, change your deployment YAML or any of that so that you can add these particular networking primitives or anything else, right? So we want to keep it com completely seamless and have the developer workflow and network uh, and the administrator workflow independent. I'm going to skip this. I'm assuming folks are aware of how many here are familiar with Kubernetes? Uh, okay. Okay. Just a quick thing, right? So Kubernetes has namespaces. Namespaces we should not confuse with tenancies. It's more about organizing certain, um, it's a way to organize stuff. Um, there's the notion of a service. Service is what is visible externally and it's backended by pods, okay? Uh, pods are the instances delivering the service, okay? And this is like a basic, um, and each pod has multiple containers. It's like a basic architecture for Kubernetes. What is it that we are doing uh, in terms of Kubernetes integration, right? Um, Kubernetes by default has a cluster mode, which means it's a flat network, so everybody can see everybody. 
okay, you don't want everybody to see everybody, then the only thing you can do is say, nobody can see any, I mean, uh, it's a complete uh, whitelist model where you say deny all first, right? So nobody should be able to uh, talk to uh, nobody. So then you have, what do you have to do? Every time a new uh, instance comes up, you have to start adding policies to say, oh, okay, you know, now A can talk to B, or B can talk to C, and so on, which is, again, complex, right? What we are doing here um, with our implementation is bringing in isolation right uh, it's not just uh, either you everybody talks to everyone or you know what i want to shut i want to shut everybody off it's about um, okay uh, within the namespace you have a namespace concept you've organized your pods into the namespace with some logical reasoning so probably they can all talk to one another in that case you can use namespace isolation right so each namespace is a virtual network of its own you can't go outside the namespace but let's say now you want actually finer granularity of isolation you can isolate to the level of your pods Right? And lastly, we have custom isolation or user-defined isolation where, heck, I want to pick this VM, I want to pick this pod, I want to pick that bare metal, I want to put them all together in the same virtual network, you can do that. Right? And there are users who have use cases who want to do that. They're more advanced in some sense, right? It's not about introducing complexity, but it's, it's about um, coming to terms with the fact that there are going to be different types of infrastructures. And like Randy mentioned, we want to be ubiquitous and we want to be infrastructure agnostic. And we want you to basically um, be able to make your transitions at whatever pace you want. Those are some, so isolation is a very key thing, and that's where a lot of our customers, as we talk to them, are seeing value. The other things we do, which uh, are gaps today in Kubernetes um, and manments, is basically um, distributed load balancing. So I talked about the service notion in the earlier slide, right? So service, uh, if you take a native Kubernetes cluster, service is backended by an HA proxy, and that'll then, um, uh, distribute load across the pods. Whereas with Contrail, you have something called ECMP load balancing. So ECMP load balancing is done through native data path. It's a distributed load balancing. What does that mean? You don't have HA proxy to manage. Service becomes a logical notion. There is no network function backending the service, right? So you have taken one more element to manage out of your equation. And it's all done natively for layer four. You still need to use HA proxy. Um, I'll talk about it in a minute as an ingress in Kubernetes if you want to do application level load balancing, which is using, let's say, your HTTP links. I talked about multi tenancy. We also, what we bring here is basically the notion of floating IPs, distributed SNAT, and all the cool features we have done um, uh, back in the OpenStack world, right? Um, so we are leveraging all that and bringing it to Kubernetes. And as Kubernetes matures and as they try to address all the use cases, these are table stake features that are needed. And what we are trying to do is bring them before even Kubernetes is able to provide. But the way we do this is without changing Kubernetes primitives, right? We want to, like I said, developer workflow independent of administrative workflow means we have to stick to what Kubernetes provides and yet give this flexibility, and that's what we are doing. We are not introducing very custom annotations or labels in Kubernetes environments. Okay. Um, yeah, so those are, this is like some of the key highlights. Um, from an architecture perspective, uh, this is basic Kubernetes architecture, right? So you have the API server, you have replication controller, uh, scheduler, and on the compute, this is more like the master node, the control node. These are the minions, and on the minions, you have uh, pods coming up with containers, right? And there's a kubelet. What we are doing with um, open contrail integration is, first of all, there is this notion of CNI, right? Connect, container networking interface. This is the standard, like OpenStack has ML2. Um, uh, CNI is a standards-based, uh, basically, it's a standardized way of integrating networking vendor plugins into Kubernetes environments. So we are going CNI way. I mean, we have supported containerized workloads for a while now, but um, uh, with the introduction of CNI, we want to leverage that. So um, the way it works is basically when uh, we, we have a kube network manager component which listens to the API server when pods get created, kube network manager informs Contrail controller. One of the things I didn't mention earlier is uh, in native Kubernetes clusters, IP address management is on a per node basis. Whereas what we give you with Contrail, uh, open Contrail is basically a centralized IPAM, which is what typically you're used to, right? So that's, again, another uh, gap we are filling. So when a pod comes up, we do IP address allocation here, right? And then Contrail controller informs um, v router agent, which is running on the, comp uh, v router agent, which is running on the compute. And 
CNI plugin, CNI plugin is an ephemeral uh, binary, right? So it comes up, it, when the pod is created, it plugs in the pod to V router, assigns IP addresses, and then it exits, right? So that way the pod gets connected to V router, and now it's ready and accessible. So that's kind of a workflow at a high level that a product manager can deliver. Okay. Sorry, that was a bad joke, but yeah. But we have, uh, on a serious note, we have uh, quite a few of our um, technical leads here in the room. So you want to go into more details about this implementation, we can have a discussion about that offline as well. Okay. How do, uh, like I said, we want to leverage Kubernetes constructs and not create our own annotations because that means in your workflows we are introducing a lot of customization, right? So how do things map? So Kubernetes has a notion of namespace. It maps, to, it maps to single project if you're doing namespace isolation, or it maps to shared project if you're doing flat uh, cluster-based uh, deployment. Pods map to virtual machine interfaces. VMIs, if you're familiar with Open Contrail, VMI is an existing concept. Service maps to, like I said, ECMP load balancing. Service is a logical notion when you use Contrail. It's nothing. Uh, no virtual function to do load balancing or physical function there. Ingress concept maps to HA proxy load balancer, which I mentioned earlier that we also package. But again, if you want to use a different uh, backend for your load balancing functionality, we work with a lot of different vendors. When it comes to network policy in Kubernetes, I mean, it's still evolving, right? I mean, this is the first time they've introduced network policy. Um, uh, in Open Contrail, we have always had rich network policies. We do service chaining using policies and so on. What network policy maps to in the Contrail world is basically security groups. So if you want to do advanced um, policies, you can still use Contrail uh, to define your rich network policies. But um, basic network policies from Kubernetes maps to security groups. Okay. Um, I'll quickly go over OpenShift and then we can open up for questions. Okay. Um, so. Um, what we are doing is leveraging our Kubernetes implementation, right, and integration to integrate with OpenShift. OpenShift, uses, OpenShift is Red Hat's PaaS, right, and OpenShift uses Kubernetes, uh, is built on top of Kubernetes. And um, OpenShift uh, addressed a lot of, let's say, uh, PaaS level gaps that Kubernetes had and has, and that's why um, we see quite a bit of traction with OpenShift. And, we have pretty good partnership with Red Hat, and we wanted to, there were customer use cases where it was very relevant that we integrate with OpenShift. So a lot of the things you heard about Kubernetes um, environment is going to apply here as well. Okay, I'm going to skip uh, OpenShift, but kind of talk about where OpenContrail plays a role in uh, OpenShift environment. So this is like a, a layered architecture of what OpenShift delivers as value. The role that Contrail plays is that of, so OpenShift comes prepackaged with a multi-tenant SDN, as they call it. Um, again, I think when it comes to multi-tenancy and SDN, we have a lot more features than what OpenShift provides natively. So the functionality that we kind of uh, plug in for is the router notion and OpenShift SDN for isolation. Right, so we are augmenting that functionality using Contrail. Okay. Now, in the OpenShift domain, it's very much similar to Kubernetes. How do we map, uh, again, namespace to single project or shared project, pod to virtual machine interfaces, services to ECMP load balancer, and the, they call it router. So the notion of ingress load balancing in Kubernetes was actually introduced by, um, was upstreamed by uh, the OpenShift team. They always had an admin router concept, which did a similar functionality. Um, and then network policy, same as security groups, okay? So we are leveraging a lot of our, what we did with Kubernetes integration to be able to integrate with OpenShift, be it OpenShift Origin or the enterprise version. I think that's basically kind of a high-level overview of what we are doing with containerized networking that I had. Sukhdev, you want to come up? So I think we have five more minutes, so I want to open up for Q&A, and uh, please feel free to ask us about networking, open contrail, or the containerized workload support that we are doing, or even the containerized control plane. Hi guys, uh, you were talking <clears throat> before about the integration where we had open something with something else inside of it, like Mesos, and then we'll load Kubernetes, and then we'll put VMware, and then we'll just like stack this whole like crazy chain together. Um, that's super fascinating to me because I've been thinking about that, like how do I make one flat network, so to speak, um, without just 
having like 87 nested tunnels. You're right. Uh, so you said you're going to talk a little bit more about that. Was that in the following presentation or? No. So. Um, uh, what I've skipped is basically the gory details of, um, not the gory details, but the details of exactly how we are implementing it. Um, we are running out of time, but what I can do, uh, we have tech leads in the room and I can talk to you as well how we are doing it. Um, let me just take one example, right? Let's say you're, you have an OpenStack deployment. Now you want to try out containerized, uh, you want to try out Kubernetes cluster. You bring up this Kubernetes cluster um, on top of your OpenStack environment, yeah? So now, um, um, you want to connect a VM in OpenStack. Actually, let me just pull up a slide. It's easier than trying to, uh, um, let me You're just pull it up in a minute. Minutes. Sorry? You're going to go over five minutes. Yeah, OK, <laughs> let's talk about it outside. But the point is, I mean, um, the way it works is you have Contrail controller residing in the OpenStack environment, yeah? And Kubernetes uh, master node running in a VM, in OpenStack VM. Right. What we what you don't need is basically uh, the entire Contrail controller container running again in the Kubernetes master node. It can run outside. And if, when you look at a compute and it has container and VM running on it, um, you have a single vRouter agent which is going to um, help connect the container to um, uh, to to the VM. Um, I can I can oh, yeah, share we'll this anyway. When, what I'll do is when we publish the slides, I'll make sure I add that slide in as well so that you get the real picture of how we are doing that. But the objective is to say what's very typical we are seeing is basically having open stack clusters and trying to have uh, nested um, Kubernetes on top of it. Mm -hmm. What I showed is obviously an uh, extreme case where you're layering up to three to four different orchestration yeah, systems. People are doing it. So, so yeah. there you go. Yeah. That's what even one of the analysts we talked to yesterday said, Gartner analysts. So I guess for something, yeah. Uh, two quick questions, if I can, about uh, networking open contrail. Sure. Um, uh, first on timelines and second, so with, with Juniper then have two product lines basically, one with monolithic, uh, uh, the monolithic uh, open contrail and the ML2 open contrail, is that the, is that the plan? Yeah, so what we're doing is we're working through the actual detail, like the devil is in the details, so we're working through those. So essentially, uh, we don't intend to uh, change anything in the back end. So possible uh, refactoring of the front end. So essentially, the API layer will still remain exactly the same. Everything below is identical. It's just two ways to come in. So you can come through Neutron through the drivers, or you can come through the web, web GUI the, the way it comes today. Let me add to that as well. It's a single product, but you'll have a, we'll be packaging both, and you'll have a config option available to pick which way you want. Yeah. Oh, I see. Deployed. So, it'll so be that's a what uh, Sid had mentioned. Option, exactly. Basically. Yeah. And and how about the the timelines? Timeline is a good question. So that that's where we need your help. <laughs> so we need contributors. Like I mentioned earlier, there are ML2 drivers. There are so many service plugins. So so we're gonna need help. So. You know, more contributors we get, more quicker we can get going. But we've already kicked off the work on the ML2 driver side of it. So hopefully we'll have that sooner. You know. All right, so uh, are you planning to like kind of formally following some sort of PEP8 policy or something like that in the Python code? What policy? Like the Python code standards, basically. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, is it, or, I mean, otherwise I would volunteer that as a suggestion because it makes the code easier you know, to read yeah, we and will. it's a little bit missing so, in the so, regular code. So you will have an opportunity to become a core of this project and <laughs> therefore <laughs> there you, go. You, you, you can do it, you can enforce it and it will be through open governance. So it's not like, you know, you know it's behind the closed doors. So it's, it, it's part of open. So it will be like any other project in the open, open stack. So, but community driven, community decides, community does everything. Yeah. Anything else? So I don't, I don't want to be too much around the timelines, but is there like a minimum set of things that you want to get out there in the first couple of minutes? So, uh, the, the, the first target is ML2, ML2 driver. So that's the first thing we, we, we have already started looking at it. Okay, how are we going to? So, the biggest issue is uh, the source of truth. When we come through Neutron, the Neutron database is the source of truth. All resources, all drivers, everything, all plugins, they work off Neutron database. 
in open contrail, the source of truth is in the uh, open contrail database. So that's once we are able to separate that out, you know, after that, it's a matter of just adding the code. And, and ML2 is our first attempt to sort of create that separation. Once we achieve that, after that, it's a matter of just bring me more warm bodies and we can simultaneously be doing four service plugins at the same time as opposed to do one and then go to the next one and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this will fix all of that. This will address all of that. I found a lot of bugs like that, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, the more bugs you find, the more you get into Juniper. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> but one thing I uh, also wanted to reiterate, which I did not cover, one thing you didn't see is MISO's integration. The reason for that is there's a Riot session, Riot game session later in the day today. Please attend that one. Um, um, uh, they will uh, be talking about how they are using MISOs and how they're using open control in that environment. So definitely add in that one. There is a question. Yes. I've seen some value in multi-hypervisor support. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, it seems that it's kind of been phased out, at least for VMware. Uh, how are, what are the plans regarding that? So are you referring to uh, VMware closing out access to the hypervisor APIs? For example, or? In a customer with a multi-hypervisor uh, environment and uh, where they start uh, integrating OpenStack. And OpenStack supports that yeah. orchestration. Yeah. And then they want to, to bring a solution. I oh, that's fine. So in a multi let's take example of OpenStack and vCenter, right, or VMware. Yeah. So in the, we have a lot of different ways of um, um, using Contrail to integrate these two clusters. You can have OpenStack, um, vCenter has a driver, right, in OpenStack. So you yeah. can have um, OpenStack on top, you can have vCenter cluster as a compute underneath, right? In that environment, we can still function oh, with vRouter running in user space on those compute nodes. You can also have pure vCenter-based clusters where you have Contrail control plane and vRouter running in user, um, user space on the ESXi nodes. And you can have an OpenStack cluster, okay, with KVM and vRouter on KVM. Um, in that case, it's going to be in kernel, and we can still bridge these two clusters, um, either with vRouter as a gateway kind of a functionality, or you know, we call it vCenter gateway functionality. Or so okay. we have a lot of different so ways of there. onboarding uh, VMware, or we have a lot of different ways to support coexistence of OpenStack and vCenter clusters. Okay. Okay. And where and other hypervisors that. Have you seen? So we are, okay, so we are obviously, the next thing we are addressing is Hyper-V. That's uh -huh. a, an implementation that's actually ongoing. Um, oh, okay. We should have it done sometime soon this year. Um, um, so that's the next hypervisor we are targeting. But typically you see KVM, ESXi, and Hyper-V. Yeah, yeah. Hyper -V, yeah right? but so during transitions, where we want to, to, to help customers with, with OpenStack, for example. Yeah, like I said, you can do both OpenStack and VMware, uh, have both environments together, and they can coexist. And okay. we have a lot of different ways of doing that. There are quite a few blogs on opencontrail.org which talk about that. Too. Okay, thank you.